This is Musings of the Shy podcast. I'm your host, Rosia Shy. Hello, Rosia Shy here, and this is another continuation of our ongoing discussion about the Bitcoin block size debate, episode 130, titled "How Did We Get Here? Why? Why? Why?" Uh, basically, this episode is just kind of summarizing the history of how we got to the point to where things have gotten so contentious. Why has the block size, the Bitcoin block size, has not scaled up. Uh, it was not something that was set in stone. It was only set as a temporary measure to address the size of the community at the time. It was always intended to scale up, and yet here we are when the problem was kind of recognized, if you will, around 2013 to begin the process of raising it. In 2014, it, you know, we began to see, you know, some serious headway to get Cody and then plans put forward that now in 2017 nothing has happened really it's just we're at a stalemate if you will and you're having all these different plans proposals being bantered around within the community and uh, things are getting very frayed uh, this is have been moving on from bitcoin and adding uh, different cryptocurrencies into their business structure from miners to wallet providers to exchanges of people that once were very strong ardent um, coin enthusiasts if you will have now migrated to different you know cryptocurrency coins this is just kind of a bit of a status sad state of affairs right now uh the stalemate we're going to just kind of go over real briefly about the, the history of why we are here, how things got kind of a little bit contentious, the different players that are part of that discussion, particularly on the core, and, but some of the businesses as well. And then the following episode, again, we'll be just kind of getting into the nitty-gritty of it all. But before we get into the heart of the matter, the new Twitch is uh, currently playing the stock market with one man's $50,000. This call comes from Polygon. Will that make millionaires or losers it or losers it or lose it all by Julia Alexandria? <clears throat> Twitch has hosted these kind of crowdsourced type of games before, the biggest one being uh, Pokemon. And more and more people are trying to experiment and, and do things on the Twitch platform to kind of engage and crowdsource people's resources or thoughts uh, or interactions, if you will. It's really probably one of the best platforms as far as uh, UI goes in having a large base to do such a thing, even though in the cryptocurrency space, you know, we have other types of crowdsource programs that are being developed and being deployed. You know, Twitch has been able to successfully kind of put these different types of ideas or events, if you will, into their space. So here we go. Over the past few years, Twitch has played everything from Pokemon to Dark Souls with the latest interaction or at least iteration of the interactive gameplay experience may have been most to gain financially. Stock stream, an interactive Twitch stream taking place right now, is experimenting in collaboration business and natural way of chaos. Developed by a software engineer, it is inspired by a similar experiment where Twitch users installed Arch Linux onto a computer. Stock stream allows Twitch users to vote on buy or sell commands. At the end of each round of voting, the stream's algorithm created by the software developer named Mike with tally of votes and place to trade. Um, I've seen the idea posted around on some subreddits, so I decided to, to build it, Mike told Polygon over at Discord, where Twitter, Twitter, Twitch users have gathered to come up with a bus plan of action for buying and selling stocks. I've just read people's buy and sell commands from the chat window, do a simple counting of each vote, take the top vote, and place that trade. That part of the system was actually easy to build. The tough part was building the UI and getting the system to a stable point where it was ready for long-term usage. Since Twitch players are used to playing actual games that come with rules, Mike imposed guidelines for the players. People type commands into the Twitch chat that correlate to the different stocks that they want to buy or sell. After five minutes is up, those votes are tallied and decided to action is opposed. All this is done through an app called Robinhood, which allows Mike and those playing to see the results of their actions occur in real time. At the core of the experiment is whether thousands of people trying to play stock market Will result in the profitable portfolio for Mike, who says he invested fifty thousand dollars out of his own pocket, or if it will come tumbling down. Now the steam must stay above twenty five thousand, according to the Financial in- in- Industries Regulatory Authority. Regulators are opposed to try and prevent the high risk of day trading. When asked if he was worried about losing money, Mike admitted he was skeptical at first, but since experiments got underway, he gained a bit of confidence in those playing. Before today, I was a bit spec skeptical that I might lose money quickly, but things seemed okay. Now that a lot of money is 
diversify, the swings in value should start getting bigger. I ran some simulations with some made-up da data and calculated that it will at last at least a couple months. But now that there are so many people using it, I'm getting lots of robot Robinhood referrals, so the account could start getting bigger and bigger. Each day of trading on stock steam begins at 9 a.m. Eastern time. Because of how automated it is, Mike said that he doesn't need to pay close attention to what happened, what's happening. He just lets the algorithm do the work. I'm actually pretty optimistic about, about how hard it will be, he said. The entire system I built is 100% automated, including the starting and stopping of the stream. So theoretically, I can just leave it running and not pay attention. More information about what Mike is trying to accomplish can be read on the official stock stream website. To join in on the selling and the buying frenzy that comes with the stock market world, but safely from your own bedroom, check out Mike's Twitch stream. So I'm going to watch an, an episode of this, if you will, and, and just see the chaos. But I find it very fascinating that he's he's so um, automated all the actions involved uh, with this process. Because that's pretty much where we're the road we're going down to. I mean, why would have a broker at all? Why have a brokerage firm? Why even have, you know, those guys that are on the uh, the stock floor that you see in the background of all the, um, was it Business Insider or Bloomberg or Wall Street Journal, whatever, whichever channel, the financial channels that are out there, that you see in the background and on the trade floor. I mean, why have those people when you can do it all through software and programming, which at the same time, you know, you still have the, you know, the hacks, um, DOS attacks. There, I'm sure there's still attack vectors, and then you know, have the possibility that people are seeking to try to do AIs. Could you know a machine pick a better stock options or a series stock options better than a human being? So it'd be fascinating to see how this uh, evolves and what the wrap up of it is will be. And if there's any you know downfall or legal legality issues um, involved in something like this, uh, Bitcoin.com: the slow criminalization of peer-to-peer -peer transfers by Whitney. Uh, Mc, McElroy. So peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin exchanges face new legal challenges in America, and the trend will probably spread to other money-hungry countries. There's a simple reason. Regulators use financial institutions such as banks to control the flow of wealth. The digital exchange companies that serve as trusted third parties are the main central point for Bitcoin. That's the point at which privacy is stripped from the users and the transfer of wealth can be closely monitored. For regulators to work, therefore, users must be headed towards trusted third parties whose function is an arm of the government. Because peer-to-peer -peer exchanges sidestep digital exchanges, the former are slowly being criminalized. Saul Manzi should, should, should serve as a cautionary tale. On May 17th, entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneur Saul Manny of Detroit, Michigan, pled guilty to violating Title 18, Section 1960 of the United States Code. The statute specifically refers to Section 530. Uh, 5330 of Title 31 in the U.S. Code of Laws, which states in part, any person who owns or controls money transmitting businesses shall register the business with the Secretary of the Treasury. Registration involves providing the feds with an impressive list of information such, which culminates with the big catch-all statement such other information as the Secretary of Treasury may require. In short, both statutes forbid a business to act as a money service without obtaining a government license and turning over any information demanded. The unlicensed man sees have been trading Bitcoin for years. At first, the purchase of Bitcoin is apparently conducted through the digital currency exchanges such as Coinbase and Bitstamp, with the sale occurring on local Bitcoins. The resulting profit was then channeled through the business and bank accounts of his corporation. Coinbase closed man sees account in 2014, partly because he had not registered with the U.S. Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, or FinCEN, as a money transmitter. Unfortunately, man sees sold Bitcoin to an undercover agent who may have been alerted to his activity by the digital exchanges his bank, or both. His residence was raided and three bank accounts were seized, which collectively amounted about $180,000. Mansi received a sentence of five years as well as a $250,000 fine. A tax investigation had not been mentioned, but one seems likely to occur. Uh, local Bitcoins is coming under attack because it is an immensely popular alternative to digital exchanges for users who wish to retain both privacy and control of their wealth. The company described itself as a peer-to-peer -peer exchange where users can buy and sell Bitcoins to and from each other. Traders advertise as an online site with the price and payment method they want to offer, as in Craigslist, buyers and sellers in the same area can find each other through published ads. Mansi is not alone. On May 2nd, prominent businessman Jason Klein pled guilty before a Missouri court to charges of conducting an unlicensed and unregistered money transmitting business. He had also sold coins through a local Bitcoin to two uncovered agents. Klein ran afoul of both the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN, 
as well as the Missouri government to operate a money transmitting business. Both Mansi and Klein may have selectively prosecuted prosecute due to their promise in order to send a warning to others. The Springfield Business Journal, May 15, reported that many in the community were left in disbelief and in confusion after Jason Klein pled guilty to the federal charge of selling Bitcoin. Klein is the president of the Association of Information Technology Professionals, Ozark's chapter, and was elected to serve their year this year on the, on the leadership council of the network, the Chambers Group for Young Professionals. He also faces up to five years in prison or $250,000 fine. If the two cases are meant as a warning to other traders, both men are likely to be both sentenced and fine. The new feature of the Coindesk site may third com- comment on the floor is similar, similar prosecutions. They include April t- 27th, Richard Pedix of New York State pled guilty to making material false statements and operating an unlicensed money transmitting business. And April 20th, Thomas um, Consano of Arizona. The rest of both Pex and Consano is complicated factors. Pex is a sex offender who legally accessed a computer, and Consano possessed ammunition in violation of agreement from a prior conviction. The money laundering charges were added later as a result of continued investigation. By contrast, Mansi's and Klein's convictions were about Bitcoin, pure and simple. So yeah, there there have been um, a lot of cases beforehand where this has happened, but a lot of it has to do with the fact that um, the individuals involved were conducting highly illegal activities. But the recent trend has been just targeting people for the selling of Bitcoin. And I, I wonder if it's a matter of time be, before undercover start posing as sellers and start nabbing buyers. And that that's when I think you're going to start seeing the outrage because you will have people that have state that these guys were just stupid. They should have known that the, that, um, that the, the people they were selling to were uncovered, that they should be more cautious or careful, that they were irresponsible. They should have you know, encrypted everything, had like a, a bug out bag, contentious plans, just being, you know, completely Batman about the whole, selling of bitcoin and then you have others that say that you should just cotton a license if you will um from within your state which is very 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 expensive you know i think the minimum payment is like a hundred thousand dollars on average just to be licensed within your state there's that a change in how the law treats peer-to-peer the preceding arrest in four different states may single a shift in how the law views and handles certain forms of peer-to-peer trading in 2016, for example, Bloomberg reported on the first state money laundering prosecution involving the virtual currency. The article opened a Florida threw out the state money laundering charges against a man who was accused of illegally selling more than uh, $1,500 in bitcoins to undercover detectives, concluding that the virtual currency doesn't qualify as money. The state is appealing the decision. Cases may no longer be thrown out. In May 6, headline in the Miami Herald stated the Florida criminals who use bitcoin can now face money laundering charges. Those arrested do not need to deal drugs, sell sex, or commit fraud, of course. Merely being unlicensed is a crime. As Jamie Redman pointed out at Bitcoin.com, the bill will essentially add Bitcoin to the current definition of monitoring instruments under Florida's Money Laundering Act. The bill has passed both Florida House and Senate and awaits the governor's signature. The peer-to-peer buyers don't seem to be targeted yet, nor is it necessary to do so for local Bitcoins to hold in America. If no peer-to-peer sellers are willing to risk uh, draconian punishments, and then digital exchanges come closer to a monopoly on sales. Either that or the sellers will apply for licenses and the government will come closer to knowing everything financial about everyone. For Bitcoin to become real freedom, it must eschew the trusted third-party approach because those parties almost interact with the government agencies in such a manner as the central banks do. They strip away privacy from customers and report, and report on their financial practices. Peer-to-peer liberates users. Personal wealth is protected from the corrupt money-grabbing of central banking. The relative anonymity it, bring, it brings allows freedom of speech, especially on controversial and political matters. This is why election ballots are cast in secret. Peer-to-peer also supports peaceful individuals who are also are called criminals by the government to, to survive the onslaught. When WikiLeaks faced a financial blockage in 2010, for example, Bitcoin became the only way most people could make a donation. Many, but not most of the donations were anonymous, and peer-to-peer exchanges will become even more important in the future because the other most effective and private peer-to-peer transfers is being threatened. Cash. Yeah, the, we've talked about it in the past of how, about the war on cash. The governments will continue to assault Bitcoin and the rights of users. Digital exchanges will continue to evolve into a grotesque imitation of crony banks. Both will fail. Before they do, how many traders will face five years in prison for the crime of selling a good 
both sends to the world to a person who wants to buy it. And has a quote in here. What is needed is an electronic payment system based on a cryptographic proof instead of trust, allowing any two willing parties to transact directly with each other without the need of a trusted third party. Toshio Nakamoto is a quote. So yeah, I think, as I stated before when I was talking about the Bolivian arrest, that there is going to be more of these um, cases coming down the pipeline. Uh, This is from Motherboard. I will have a link in the show notes. I'm not going to read the entire article. But this is, um, I just find it very fascinating how something old is new again, if you will. Uh, the first text adventure game ever is finally open source by Jordan Pearson. Colossal Cave Adventure is due for an update. Colossal Cave Adventure is one of the first text-based adventure games. It was developed in 1976 using one of the earliest computer programming languages and at the same time as the earliest versions of the internet itself, ARPANET. The game is an important part of both hacking and gaming history, and now Colossal Cave Adventures code is online and open source. Last week, longtime champion of open source code, Eric S. Raymond, uh, S. Ray- Raymond, announced that he uploaded the game's code to GitLab, a site for developers to corroborate with the permission of the game's original designers. People from all over the world can now work together to clean up the code, improve it, and bring it up to speed with modern computer standards. The code, this is the code that fully deserves to be in the Museum of Great Artifacts of Hacker History. Raymond wrote on his blog, but there's a very basic question about the artifact like this. Should a museum preserve it in a static form as close to the original as possible? Or is it more in the right spirit to encourage the folk process <clears throat> or is it more the right the right spirit to encourage the folk the folk process to continue improving the code? He chose the latter. Colossal Cave Adventure has the players has the player exploring a gigantic cave network through text based commands. The game was the brainchild of programmer Will uh, Crother, who in nineteen seventy six was helping to create ARPANET, the government-funded computer network that eventually became the internet from scratch. At the time, the game ran on the same primitive, gigantic, room-filling computers that were being used to build out ARPANET. And it just kind of continues on. Um, I hope that more of these old um, DOS games, I know there was a theme really about uh, someone collecting all the Apple II games and trying to preserve them. I would love to see that more of this... uh, happen to where people are able to take the old codes from various old games update them i know there's a lot of emulators for like atari games old nintendo games and stuff like that but these really early old adventure text-based command games would be very fascinating i also think it would be a great learning tool for um, kids to learn you know the kind of the basics of code um and building building it up and building it out if you will be a great project to for someone like that you know maybe given the sophistication of, you know, Raspberry Pis or um, Andronis, I think is what it's called, those type of computer bo- board games. I wonder if you could be able to successfully port and have um, add-ons like a screen or something like that and have these games on there and be able to play and code and stuff like that. But I just found it a very intriguing and fascinating. I personally never played this game, but I played Similar text-based games that came out, you know, primarily in the 80s, you know, the biggest one being, you know, Oregon Trail, but I just found that very fascinating. So, the last bit about this, though, before we get on to the heart of the matter is that, you know, because everything is becoming, you know, computer-based and digital, the, the ability to preserve this information, given that uh, CDs decay, um, even floppy disks de- decay, to be able to preserve these codes and to be able to know what has happened at a given moment in time when it's preserved in a manner that for centuries it was basically, you know, paper-based or um, in stone. For something that is not as permanent, something that's, um, like I said, it can decay far easier than paper or something like that, or even stone. Uh, to have something being preserved and continue on is... Um, important, I think, just for the overall history of the internet and just the history of of different points in time being able to be remembered, if you will. So that is it for the news. Um, on to uh, why we are here. So here is an excellent uh, Reddit post that kind of summarizes how the contention started, really. While the issue of the block size has been kind of bantered around within the community and the debate about uh, the actual proposal of solutions and the, the spats um, or shots fired as I talked about it in um, the back-to-back episode in which I discussed all the different animosity 
that was going on where people were kind of personally attacking each other and are still personally attacking each other from uh, business providers, wallet providers, miners, uh, different core developers, former core developers, um, other people that have developed their own proposals. Everyone's just kind of personally attacking one another. So here we go. This is from user Sound8Bits, the origins of the block size debate on our Bitcoin. And this is probably far one of the best kind of summaries I have seen thus far on the subject matter. So on May 4th, 2015, Gavin Andreessen wrote on his blog, I was planning to submit a pull request to the 0.11 release of the Bitcoin Core that will allow miners to create blocks bigger than one megabyte starting a little less than a year from now. But this process of pre-review turned up a technical issue that needs to get addressed, and I don't think it can be fixed in time for the first 0.11 release. I'll be writing a series of blog posts, each addressing one argument against raising the maximum block size or against scheduling a raise right now. Please send me an email, and he provides his email, if I'm missing any arguments. And this is this right here comes from the um, comment comes from the put up, um, from the poster. In other words, Gavin proposed a hard fork via, via series of blog posts, bypassing all developer communication channels altogether and asking for personal private emails from anyone interested in discussing the proposal further. On May 5th, one day after Gavin submitted his first blog post, Mike Hearn published the capacity clip on his Medium page. Two days later, he posted a crash landing and Lee's post he argued. A common argument for letting block, Bitcoin blocks fill up is that the outcome won't be so bad, just a market for fees. This is wrong. I don't believe fees will become high and stable if Bitcoin runs out of capacity. As stated, I believe Bitcoin will crash. The permanent backlog will start to build up, and as the backlog grows, nodes will start running out of memory and dying. As a core, we accept any transactions as valid without any limit, and node crash is eventually inevitable. And this is a comment from the uh, poster. He also in a later article explained that he disagreed with Satoshi's vision of how Bitcoin would mature. Neither me nor Gavin believe a fee market will work as a substitute for the inflation subsidy. And then here's another comment from the poster. Gavin continued to publish a series of blog posts and he announced while Mike Hearn made these predictions. So, right off the bat, what happened here was that basically Gavin kind of bypassed the traditional method of which uh, the developers were communicating with one another and just kind of went public. And this rackled a lot of people's feathers. He was like, no, no, you're not supposed to do that. And... Again, this is a space where you're supposed to be able to do anything and everything, and no one has even direct say. So for people to be upset by this, in particular, more so about, not necessarily so, more, more so, not necessarily so much about his position or his wanting to raise the block size, but the fact that he just kind of went public and was asking anybody and everyone, any Tom, Dick, Harry, and Joe, to give their comments or make any contribution to his proposal without even discussing it or going towards the um, normal core developers, if you will, or that process. And here comes from the um, poster. Matt Corolla brought Gavin's proposal up at the Bitcoin dev mailing list after a few days, and he wrote, Now, mind you, we already discussed this, that Matt Corolla, Gavin Andreessen, and Mike Hearn were all core developers, with Gavin Andreessen and Mike Hearn having left, really, the project, if you will. And Gavin Andreessen was the guy that was handed the keys by Satoshi Nakamoto himself. So here's Matt Corolla. Recently, there's been a flurry of posts by Gavin in which he advocates strongly for increasing the maximum block size. However, there hasn't been any discussion on this mailing list in several years as far as I could tell. Which isn't quite true. So at the risk of starting a flame war, I'll provide a little bait to get some response and hope the discussion opens up in an honest comparison of trade-offs here. Certainly a consensus is this kind of technical community would should be a basic requirement for any serious comment, commitment to the block size increasing. Personally, I rather strongly against any uh, commitment to a block size increase in the near future. Long-term incentive c compatibility requires that there be some fee pressure that the blocks be relatively consistently full or very nearly full. What we see today are transactions enjoying next block confirmations with nearly zero pressure to include any fee at all though many do because it makes wallet code simpler. This allows a well-funded Bitcoin ecosystem to continue building systems which rely on transactions moving quickly into blocks while pretending these systems scale. This, thus, instead of working on technology to bring Bitcoin's trustless, trustlessness to systems which scale beyond a blockchain is necessarily slow and comparing to updating numbers and databases expensive settlement, 
The ecosystem as a whole continues to focus on building centralized platforms and advocates for changes to Bitcoin, which will allow them to maintain the status quo. Uh, shortly thereafter, Coral explained further, the point of the hard, hard block size limit exactly because giving miners free rule to do anything they like with their blocks would allow them to do any number of crazy attacks. The incentives for miners to pick block sizes are nowhere near compatible with what allows the network to continue to run in a decentralized manner. So the heart of the matter of the discussion a lot of people have had was that the miners might have gained too much power within the network in itself. Two, um, like he stated here, uh, we won't be having a decentralized system any longer because oh. nodes would be able to uh, continue to be conducting a public ledger because they, they'll run out of memory or the bandwidth issues. Miners will have you know, the specialty of mining become even more specialized where no one is able to get into the game because the technology required to propagate larger block sizes, it will be out of the of a majority of people, which is already kind of sort of the case in it itself. And then Tier Nolan considered possible extensions and modifications might improve Gavin's proposal and argued that soft caps could be used to mitigate against the dangers of block size increase. Tom Harding voiced supporting for Gavin's proposal. Peter Todd mentioned that a limited block size provides the benefit of protecting against the perverse incentives behind potential block withholding attacks, which we will explain right here. So here it is. Uh, it comes from the mailing list. So this is Peter Todd's response. I also point out that miners with goals of finding more blocks than the competition, a viable long-term strategy to increase market share and for a short-term strategy to get more transaction fees, actually have a, a perverse incentive to ensure the blocks do not get to more than 30% of the hashing power. The main thing holding them back from doing that is the inflation subsidy is still quite high. Better to get rewarded now than to try to push your competition out of business. It's possible that a limited block size there won't be an aptitude to delay propagating by processing larger blocks. If blocks propagate in a matter of, of second worst case, there's no opportunity for gaming the system. But it does strongly show that we must build a system where the worst case propagation time in all circumstances is very short relative to the block interval. So basically, you're going to cause where the incentives for most miners to be in, a, in to mining is not going to happen because they might not have the capacity to to increase their block size or they might not be incentivized because they're not going to get the same amount of reward. Uh, they're going to get the same amount of reward for more work um, and the fees might not necessarily be of the same value because you're going to still have, you might not have the same fee market system because at a smaller block rate, the, the fees are high, but at the larger block rate, the fees are low because you're going to be able to report more and, and just, you know, the economics of it all. So what you end up having is that the miners might not mine as effectively or efficiently um, with the network, kind of like what's happening now with the low transaction fees where you have such a, a backlog in the mean pool that there there are some transactions that do get kicked back, kicked out, if you will. And then you have wallet providers are allowing you to skip ahead if you pay extra, even though you've already sent out your transaction. So there's that too. Uh, Slushers don't have a strong opinion on one way or the other, and neither did Eric Lombrazo. Though Eric was interested in developing developing hard fork best practices and wanted to explore all the complexities involving with deployment of hard forks. Let's just not do a one-off ad hoc thing. Uh, Matt Willock voiced his opinion. I'm not so much opposed to a block size increase as I'm opposed to a hard fork. I strongly fear that a hard fork itself will become an excuse to change as other aspects of the system and the ways that were unintended and possibly de disastrous in consequences. Uh, Brian Bishop strongly opposed Gavin's proposal and offered a philosophical perspective in the matter. There have been significant double uh, public discussions about why increasing the max block size is, is kicking the can down the road while possibly compromising the blockchain security. There were many excellent objectives that were raised that sadly I see are not referenced at all in the recent media blitz. Frankly, I can't help but feel that if the contributors like those from um, hashtag Bitcoin Wizard have been ignoring in lieu of technical analysis in the absence of discussion on this mailing list. I feel perhaps there are other subtle and extremely important technical details that are completely absent this and other proposals. Secure decentralization is the most important and most interesting property of Bitcoin. Everything else is rather trivial and could be achieved millions of times more efficiently with conventional technology. Other technical work should be informed by the technical nature of the system we have constructed. There is no doubt in my mind that Bitcoin will always see that the most extreme campaigns and the most extreme misunderstandings for de development purposes 
We must hold ourselves to extremely high standards before proposing changes, especially to the public, that has potential to be unsafe and economically, uns economically unsafe. There are many potential techno technical solutions for aggregating millions, trillions of transactions into tiny bundles. A small proof of concept image, two parties sending transactions back and forth a hundred million times. Instead of recording every transaction, you record the start date and the end date and end with the two transactions or less. That's a hundred million fold without modifying max block size and without potentially compromising security centralization. The MIT group should listen up and get to work on finding how to measure decentralization and security. Getting this measurement right should really be beneficial because we would have a more academic and technical understanding to work with. And then you have Gregory Maxwell, echoed and extended that perspective. When Bitcoin is changed fundamentally via hard fork to have different properties, the change can create winners or losers. There are a non-trivial number of people who hold extremes on any of these general belief patterns. Even among the core developers, there is not a consensus on Bitcoin's optimal role in society in the commercial marketplace. There is at least a two-fold concern on this particular long-term mining incentive front. One is that the long-held argument is that the security of the Bitcoin system is a long-term depends on fee income funding, Anonymous, anonymous, decentralized, autonomous, anonymous, decentralized miners profitability applying each hash power to make a reorganization infeasible. For fees to achieve this purpose, there, there seemingly must be an effective scarcity of capacity. The second is that when subsidy is fallen well below fees, the incentive to move the blockchain forward goes away. An optimal rational miner will be best off, off forking off the current best block in order to capture its fees rather than moving the blockchain forward. Tools like the Lightning Net Network proposal will allow us to hit a greater spectrum of demand at once, including uh, securing zero confirmation, sometimes the larger block size reduced, if anything, which is important for many applications. With the right technology, I believe we can have our cake and eat it too, but there needs to be a reason to build it. The security and decentralized level of Bitcoin imposes a hard upper limit on anything that can be based on it. Another key component is that the small bumps in the block size, which could clearly knock the system to a largely centralized mode, small co constants are small enough that they, they don't quantify change, the operation of the system, they don't open up new applications that aren't possible today. The procedure I would, I would refer, refer would be something like this. If there's a standing backlog, we, the community of users, look to indicators to gauge that the network is losing decentralization and then double the hard limit with proper controls to allow smooth adjustments without fees going to zero. See the past proposals for the automatic block size controls that let miners increase up, up to the hardware maximum over the medium if the miners are quadratically hard difficulty. And we don't increase it if here to be substantial increases. Okay, so kind of going down here. Many people, myself included, have been working feverishly hard behind the scenes on Bitcoin Core to increase the scalability. The work is a small potatoes boring software engineer, engineering stuff. I mean, even my personal con contributions include things like inventing a whole wholly new generic algebraic optimization applicable to all EC signature schemes that increase performance by 4%, and that's before getting into the R&D stuff that, hardly, that hasn't really borne fruit yet, like fraud proofs. Today, Bitcoin Core is easily 100 times faster to synchronize and realize and relay than when I first got involved on the same hardware, but these improvements have been swallowed by the growth. The ironic thing is that our frantic efforts to keep ahead and not lose decent, decentralization have both not been enough. By best measure, the full node usage is the lowest it's been since 2011, even though the user base is huge now. And also, so much that people can seriously talk about increasing the block size to something gigantic like two, like 20 megabytes. It sounds less reasonable than you realize that even at one megabyte, we're likely having a smoking hole in the ground, if not for the existing enormous efforts to make scaling not come at the loss of decentralization. So at the heart of the matter, of just beyond just raising the block size, is that the nature of the viewpoint of how people view Bitcoin. And people are seeing it as, you know, we needed to keep it decentralized where anyone can participate that is not decentralized systems, whether it be exchanges, wallets, miners, the running the whole full node aspect that there's not enough of them and that with so many people participating, they're not, maybe not participating in the right way, if you will, not running a full node, that everyone should be running a full node, if you will. This, you know, kind of gets in the heart of the matter. And some of this kind of gets lost in the sauce where people don't realize certain usabilities and feasibilities of when you have as many people within the community, but even when it was smaller, how people view Bitcoin. And you can be as technical as you want and just focus on the code. 
but you has to you have to also you have to also incorporate the human aspect in how people want to use this type of system. And then Peter, so some developers, IG, Aaron Voss, voice support for Gavin proposal, which repeated my current crash landing arguments. Peter Wool said, I'm in, in general in favor of increasing the size block. Uh, controversial hard forks, I hope the mailing list here today already provides a controversial issue. Independent personal opinions pro or against, I don't think we can do a hard fork that is controversial in nature. Either result is a, effectively a fork. If pre existing coins can be spent once on both sides, effectively failing Bitcoin's primary purpose. Or the result is a one side force to upgrade to something that they dislike, effectively giving a power to the developers they should never have. Quote as someone, I do not sign up to be part of a central banker's community. Uh, the reason increase in, for the increase is needed. If we need more space in blocks, is the reason to do an upgrade. It won't stop after 20 megabytes. There's nothing fundamentally possible with 20 megabytes that isn't, that isn't, po- that isn't with one megabyte blocks. Misrepresentation, misrepresentation of the trade offs. You can all, you can argue all you want that none of the effects of the larger blocks are particularly damaging, so everything is fine. They will damage something. See below for details, and we should analyze these effects and, and be honest about them and present them as trade-offs made with choices to make the scale system better. If you wish to ask people if they want more transactions, of course you'll hear yes. If you ask people if they want to pay less taxes, I'm sure the vast majority will agree as well. Minor centralization. There is currently, as far as I know, no technology that can relay and validate 20 megabyte blocks across the planet in a manner fast enough to avoid very significant costs to mining. There's work in progress on, the, on this, including Gavin's IBLT-based relay or Greg's block network coding. But I don't think we should be basing the future of economics on this, of a system on undemonstrated ideas. Without those, or even with, the result may be the miners self-limit the size of the blocks to propagate faster. But if this happens, larger, better connected and more centralized local groups of miners can gain a competitive advantage by being able to produce larger blocks. I'd like to point out that there's nothing evil about this. A simple feedback to determine an optimal block size for an individual miner result in a larger block blocks for better connected hash power. If we do not want miners to have this ability, we, as in those using full nodes, should demand limitations that prevent it. One such limitation is a block size limit and whatever it is. The ability to use full nodes. Skewing and incentives for improvements without casual pressure to work on these, I doubt much will change. Increasing the size of blocks now will save them make it cheap enough to continue business as usual for a while, while forcing a massive cost increase and not just for monetary ones on the entire ecosystem. Fees and long-term incentives. I don't think one megabyte block is optional. Block size is a compromise between scalability of transactions and the verifi- verifiability of the system. A system with 10 transactions per day that is verified by pocket calculator is not useful as it would only serve a few large bank settlements. A system which can deal with every coffee bought on the planet but requires a Google sale data center to verify it is also not useful as it would be truly out competed by the Visa like design. The useful needs is balanced and there's no optimal choice for everyone. We can choose where the balance lies but we must accept that this is done as a trade off and then the trade off will have costs such as hardware costs, decreasing anonymity, less independence Small targeted audience for the people able to fully validate and choose wisely. And then Mike Kearns was thought, The list is not a good place for making progress or reaching decisions. If Bitcoin continues on the growth trends, it will run out of capacity almost certainly by the sometime next year, which it has occurred. We need to write, see right now the leadership and plan that fits in the available time window. I no longer believe that this community can reach consensus on anything protocol related, which is true. When the money supply eventually dwindles, I doubt it will be fee pressures to funds mining. What I don't see from you, you yet is a specific credible plan that fits with the next 12 months and which allows Bitcoin to keep growing. Peter Todd wrote that, uh, that pointing out that contrary to Mike's claims, developer consensus has been achieved within the core plenty of times recently. And BTC Dark asked Mike to explain where the 12 month time frame comes from. And this is when things start getting really contentious as people start sniping at each other. A hoary tone wrote an incredibly present reply to Mike. I'm not going to kind of get into it. Some suspect that Gavin slash Mike were trying to rush the hard fork for personal reasons. Mike Kern's response was was to demand a leader who can unilaterally steer the Bitcoin project and make decisions on check. So Mike Kern wrote that not what I meant is that someone theoretically well there needs to make a clear decision. If a decision in the Bitcoin core will will wait and watch the fireworks when blocks get full, that would be showing leadership. I write more on the topic of what happened if we hit the block size limit. I don't believe that we'll get any useful data out of such an event. 
I even distribute systems run out of the capacity for, but what will happen instead is that the technical failure is followed by rapid user abandonment. I'm not sure the user abandonment is happening, but you you are seeing that uh, Bitcoin is not the dominant force any longer. You know, you have ETC rising, Rootstock, Litecoin, other cryptocurrencies have taken its place. Zcash, Dash, Monero. Uh, we need to hear something like that from one there or whoever has final say around here. And then I'm going to read Jorge uh, Timo's response. It's true that the universal uncom- universally un controversial, which is what I think the requirement should be for hard forks, is a vague qualifier that's not formally defined anywhere. I guess we should only consider rational arguments. We cannot just knack something without further explanation. If this explanation was, I will change my mind after we increase block size, I guess the community should say that we will just ignore your knack because it makes no sense. In the same way that people use fallacies purposely or not, we must expose that and say that the fallacy doesn't count as an argument. But yeah, it would probably be good to define better what constitutes a sensible o- objection or something that doesn't seem simple, though. It seems that some people will like to see that happening before the subsidies are low, not necessarily null. While well, other people are fine waiting for that, but don't want to ever be close to the scale limit limits anytime soon, I would also like to know for how long we need to prioritize short-term adoption in this way. Others say that if the answer is forever adoption is always the most important thing, then we'll end up with an improved version of Visa. But yeah, this is progress. I'll wait for your more detailed descriptions of the tragedies that will follow hitting the block limits, assuming from now that it will happen in 12 months. Which it has happened, but previous answers you ner- to be nervous. We will hit the block limits in 12 months, and if you don't do anything, was well, not sh- not sure about 12 months, but whatever, great. I'm waiting for that to observe how, feel- how fees get affected. They rose. But it should have been given a question, what's wrong with hitting the block limits in 12 months? And then my current... Uh, Again, I started the need for a leader. There must be a single decision maker for any given code base. Brian Bishop, Bishop attempts to explain why this makes sense with a Git architect. And finally, Gavin announced his intent to merge the patch into Bitcoin XT to bypass the peer review he received on the Bitcoin dev mailing list. So he basically took his ball and left. Well, there had been, um, and it, you can kind of go in the comment section, uh, origins of the debate going back as far as you know 2010. This is where things start really to split when Gavin and Deason basically kind of left uh, the Bitcoin core. Mike Kern would, you know, kind of eventually follow. And you have all these different solutions from SegWit that was proposed um, during this time frame, Bitcoin XT, Bitcoin Classic, and then eventually we got Bitcoin Unlimited, Bitcoin, all these different stuff going on. Again, you can see kind of the same players, you know, Gregory Maxwell in here. Mike Hearn, uh, Peter Todd, all kind of going back and forth in the discussion about what is essentially the core of Bitcoin. Is it this decentralized system of store value uh, that allows for people to transmit wealth back to forth from one another? Or are we just duplicating Visa where we're having a Visa transactions and does that make any kind of practical sense? Should people be able to buy coffee on this type of system? Does that make any type of sense? Uh, miners' incentives, the importance of miners, and are they going to be able to be in a position or a place to continue to be mining and be incentivized economically with the fees in fighting the Bitcoin? And what happens when the, when we increase the block size and then you have nodes which are supposed to validate the entire system, which are not compensated? People who operate nodes are not compensated within the Bitcoin system. People just do it to do it for the purpose of keeping the network going, if you will. So there's that. And all this in the sauce, if you will, all this is what kind of really is the beginning of the contention where we get these different proposals within the Bitcoin core itself. There's two different versions of uh, SegWit. Uh, and we'll, we'll break down all the different kind of from the core developers themselves and their different proposals to address the scaling issues and addressing uh, the usage of Bitcoin in general out there on the network. But it's just kind of a reminder here of how there was a kind of a split, there was a contention, and people kind of went different ways. And what the thought process is of the people that were responsible for coding the, the protocol. So that was all the way in March, and it's when back in this down all the way that year of 2015, is when SegWit was proposed by Peter Will. I'm going to read this article from Coindesk, and then it's going to pretty much wrap up the episode, if you will. 
So here is an excellent uh, Reddit post that kind of summarizes how the contention started, really. While the issue of the block size has been kind of bantered around within the community and been debated about, uh, the actual proposal of solutions and the, the spats um, or shots fired, as I talked about it in um, the back-to-back episode, in which I discussed all the different animosity that was going on where people were kind of personally attacking each other and are still personally attacking each other from uh, business providers, wallet providers, miners, uh, different core developers, former core developers, um, other people that have developed their own proposals. Everyone's just kind of personally attacking one another. So here we go. This is from user Sound8Bits, the origins of the block size debate on our Bitcoin. And this is probably far as one of the best kind of summaries I have seen thus far on the subject matter. So on May 4th, 2015, Gavin Andreessen wrote on his blog, I was planning to submit a pull request to the 0.11 release of the Bitcoin Core that will allow miners to create blocks bigger than one megabyte starting a little less than a year from now. But this process of pre-review turned up a technical issue that needs to get addressed, and I don't think it can be fixed in time for the first 0.11 0.11 release. I'll be writing a series of blog posts, each addressing one argument against raising the maximum block size or against scheduling a raise right now. Please send me an email, and he provides his email if I'm missing any arguments. And this is this right here comes from the um, comment comes from the put up, um, from the poster. In other words, Gavin proposed a hard fork via via series of blog posts bypassing all developer communication channels altogether and asking for personal private emails from anyone interested in discussing the proposal further. On May 5th, one day after Gavin submitted his first blog post, Mike Hearn published the capacity clip on his Medium page. Two days later, he posted a crash landing and in these posts he argued. A common argument for letting block, Bitcoin blocks fill up is that the outcome won't be so bad, just a market for fees. This is wrong. I don't believe fees will become high and stable if Bitcoin runs out of capacity. As stated, I believe Bitcoin will crash. A permanent backlog will start to build up, and as the backlog grows, nodes will start running out of memory and dying. As a core, we accept any transactions as valid without any limit, and node crash is eventually inevitable. And this is a comment from the uh, poster. He also in a later article explained that he disagreed with Satoshi's vision of how Bitcoin would mature. Neither me nor Gavin believe a fee market will work as a substitute for the inflation subsidy. And then here's another comment from the poster. Gavin continued to publish a series of blog posts, and he announced while Mike Hearn made these predictions. So right off the bat, what happened here was that basically Gavin kind of bypassed the traditional method of which uh, the developers were communicating with one another, and he just kind of went public. And this rackled a lot of people's feathers. He's like, no, no, you're not supposed to do that. And again, this is a space where you're supposed to be able to do anything and everything, and no one has any direct say. So... For people to be upset by this, in particular, more so about not necessarily so more, more so not necessarily so much about his position or his wanting to raise the block size, but the fact that he just kind of went public was asking anybody and everyone, any Tom, Dick, Harry, and Joe, to give their comments or make any contribution to his proposal without even discussing it or going towards the. Um, normal core developers, if you will, or that process. And here comes from the um, poster. Matt Corolla brought Gavin's proposal up at the Bitcoin dev mailing list after a few days, and he wrote, Now, mind you, we already discussed this, that Matt Corolla, Gavin Andreessen, and Mike Kern were all core developers, with Gavin Andreessen and Mike Kern having left, really, the project, if you will. And Gavin Andreessen was the guy that was handed the keys by Satoshi Nakamoto himself. So here's Matt Corolla. Recently, there's been a flurry of posts by Gavin in which he advocates strongly for increasing the maximum block size. However, there hasn't been any discussion on this mailing list in several years as far as I could tell, which isn't quite true. So at the risk of starting a flame war, I'll provide a little bait to get some response and hope the discussion opens up in an honest comparison of trade-offs here. Certainly, a consensus is this kind of technical community would should be a basic requirement for any serious comment, commitment to the block size increasing. Personally, I rather strongly against any uh, commitment to a block size increase in the near future. Long-term incentive c- compatibility requires that there be some fee pressure that the block fee runs be consistently full or very nearly full. 
What we see today are transactions enjoying next block confirmations with nearly zero pressure to include any fee at all, though many do because it makes wallet code simpler. This allows a well-funded Bitcoin ecosystem to continue building systems which rely on transactions moving quickly into blocks while pretending these systems scale. This, thus, instead of working on technology to bring Bitcoin's trustless, trustlessness to systems which scale beyond a blockchain is necessarily slow and comparing to updating numbers and databases expensive settlement, the ecosystem as a whole continues to focus on building centralized platforms and advocates for changes to Bitcoin which will allow them to maintain the status quo. Uh, shortly thereafter, Coral explained further, the point of the hard, hard block size limit exactly because giving miners free rule to do anything they like with their blocks would allow them to do any number of crazy attacks. The incentives for miners to pick block sizes are nowhere near compatible with what allows the network to continue to run in a decentralized manner. So the heart of the matter of the discussion a lot of people have had was that the miners might have gained too much power within the network in itself. Two, um, like he stated here, uh, we won't be having a decentralized system any longer because oh. nodes wouldn't be able to uh, continue to be conducting a public ledger because they, they'll run out of memory or the bandwidth issues. Miners will have you know, the specialty of mining become even more specialized where no one is able to get into the game because the technology required to propagate larger block sizes, it will be out of space of a majority of people, which is already kind of sort of the case in, in it itself. And then Tier Nolan considered possible extensions and modifications might improve Gavin's proposal and argued that soft caps could be used to mitigate against the dangers of block size increase. Tom Harding voiced supporting for Gavin's proposal. Peter Todd mentioned that a limited block size provides the benefit of protecting against the perverse incentives behind potential block withholding attacks, which we will explain right here. So here it is. Uh, it comes from the mailing list. So this is Peter Todd's response. I also point out that miners with goals of finding more blocks than the competition, a viable long-term strategy to increase market share and for a short-term strategy to get more transaction fees, actually have a, a perverse incentive to ensure the blocks do not get to more than 30% of the hashing power. The main thing holding them back from doing that is the inflation subsidy is still quite high. Better to get rewarded now than to try to push your competition out of business. It's possible that a limited block size there won't be an opportunity to delay propagating by processing larger blocks. If blocks propagated in a matter of, of second worst case, there's no opportunity for gaming the system. But it does strongly show that we must build a system where the worst case propagation time in all circumstances is very short relative to the block interval. So basically, you're going to cause where the incentives for most miners to be in, a, in to mining is not going to happen because they might not have the capacity to to increase their block size or they might not be incentivized because they're not going to get the same amount of reward. Uh, they're going to get the same amount of reward for more work um, and the fees might not necessarily be of the same value because you're going to still have you might not have the same fee market system because at a smaller block rate, the, the fees are high, but at the larger block rate, the fees are low because you can be able to put more and just, you know, the economics of it all. So what you end up having is that the miners might not mine as effectively or efficiently um, with the network, kind of like what's happening now with the low transaction fees where you have such a, a backlog in the mean pool that there there are some transactions that do get kicked back kicked out if you will and then you have wallet providers are allowing you to skip ahead if you pay extra even though you've already sent out your transactions so there's that too uh slushes don't have a strong opinion on one way or the other and neither did eric lombrazo though eric was interested in developing developing hard fork best practices and wanted to explore all the complexities evolving with deployment of hard forks. Let's just not do a one-off ad hoc thing. Uh, Matt Willock voiced his opinion. I'm not so much opposed to a block size increase as I'm opposed to a hard fork. I strongly fear that a hard fork itself will become an excuse to change as other aspects of the system and the ways that were unintended and possibly de disastrous in consequences. Uh, Brian Bishop strongly opposed Gavin's proposal and offered a philosophical perspective of the matter. There have been significant double uh, public discussions about why increasing the max block size is, is kicking the can down the road while possibly compromising the blockchain security. There were many excellent objectives that were raised that sadly I see are not referenced at all in the recent media blitz. Frankly, I can't help but feel that if the contributors like those from um, hashtag Bitcoin Wizard have been ignoring in lieu of technical analysis in the absence of discussion on this mailing list. 
that I feel perhaps there are other subtle and extremely important technical details that are completely absent this and other proposals. Secure decentralization is the most important and most interesting property of Bitcoin. Everything else is rather trivial and can be achieved millions of times more efficiently with conventional technology. Other technical work should be informed by the technical nature of the system we have constructed. There is no doubt in my mind that Bitcoin will always see that the most extreme campaigns and the most extreme misunderstandings for de development purposes, we must hold ourselves to extremely high standards before proposing changes, especially to the public, that have the potential to be unsafe and economically, uns economically unsafe. There are many potential techn technical solutions for aggregating millions, trillions of transactions into tiny bundles. A small proof of concept image, two parties sending transactions back and forth a hundred million times. Instead of recording every transaction, you record the start date and the end date and end with the two transactions or less. That's a hundred million fold without modifying max block size and without potentially compromising secure decentralization. The MIT group should listen up and get to work on finding how to measure decentralization and security. Getting this measurement right should really be beneficial because we would have a more academic and technical understanding to work with. And then you have Gregory Maxwell, echoed and extended that perspective. When Bitcoin is changed fundamentally via hard fork to have different properties, the change can create winners or losers. There are a non-trivial number of people who hold extremes on any of these general belief patterns. Even among the core developers, there is not a consensus on Bitcoin's optimal role in society in the commercial marketplace. There is at least a two-fold concern on this particular long-term mining incentive front. One is that the long-held argument is the security of the Bitcoin system is a long-term depends on fee income funding, anonymous, anonymous decentralized, autonomous, anonymous decentralized miners' profitability applying each hash power to make a reorganization infeasible. For fees to achieve this purpose, there seemingly must be an effective scarcity of capacity. The second is that when subsidy is fallen well below fees, the incentive to move the blockchain forward goes away. An optimal rational miner will be best off, off forking off the current best block in order to capture its fees rather than moving the blockchain forward. Tools like the Lightning Net Network proposal will allow us to hit a greater spectrum of demand at once, including uh, securing zero confirmations, sometimes the larger block size reduced, if anything, which is important for many applications. With the right technology, I believe we can have our cake and eat it too. But there needs to be a reason to build it. The security and decentralized level of Bitcoin imposes a hard upper limit on anything that can be based on it. Another key component is that the small bumps in the block size, which could clearly knock the system to a largely centralized mode, small co constants are small enough that they, they don't quantify change, the operation of the system, they don't open up new applications that aren't possible today. The procedure I would refer to prefer would be something like this. If there's a standing backlog, we, the community of users, look to indicators as gauge of the network is losing decentralization and then double the hard limit with proper controls to allow smooth adjustments without fees going to zero. See the past proposals for the automatic block size controls that let miners increase up, up to the hardware maximum over the medium if the miners are quadratically hard difficulty. And we don't increase it if here to be substantial increases. Okay, so kind of going down here. Many people, myself included, have been working feverishly hard behind the scenes on Bitcoin Core to increase the scalability. The work is a small potatoes boring software engineer, engineering stuff. I mean, even my personal con contributions include things like inventing a wholly, wholly new generic algebraic optimization applicable to all EC signature schemes that increase performance by 4%, and that's before getting into the R&D stuff that hardly, that hasn't really bore fruit yet, like fraud proofs. Today, Bitcoin Core is easily 100 times faster to synchronize and realize and relay than when I first got involved on the same hardware, but these improvements have been swallowed by the growth. The ironic thing is that our frantic efforts to keep ahead and not lose decentralization have both not been enough. By best measure, the full node usage is the lowest it's been since 2011, even though the user base is huge now. And also, so much that people can seriously talk about increasing the block size to something gigantic like two, like 20 megabytes. It sounds less reasonable than you realize that even at one megabyte, we're likely having a smoking hole in the ground if it not for the existing enormous efforts to make scaling not come at the loss of decentralization. So at the heart of the matter, of just beyond just raising the block size, is that the nature of the viewpoint of how people view Bitcoin. And people are seeing it as, you know, we needed to keep it decentralized where anyone can participate that is not decentralized systems, whether the exchanges, wallets, miners, the running the whole full node aspect that there's not enough of them and that with so many people participating they're not 
maybe not participated in the right way, if you will, not running a full node, that everyone should be running a full node, if you will. This, you know, kind of gets in the heart of the matter. And some of this kind of gets lost in the sauce where people don't realize that certain usabilities and feasibilities of when you have as many people within the community, but even when it was smaller, how people view Bitcoin. And you can be as technical as you want and just focus on the code. But you have to, you have to also... Com- you have to also incorporate the human aspect in how people want to use this type of system. And then Peter, so some developers, IG, Aaron Voss, voice support for Gavin proposal, which repeated my current crash landing arguments. Peter Will said, I'm in, in general in favor of increasing the size block. Uh, controversial hard forks, I hope the mailing list here today already provides a controversial issue. Independent personal opinions pro or against, I don't think we can do a hard fork that is controversial in nature. Either result is a, effectively a fork. If pre-existing coins can be spent once on both sides, effectively failing Bitcoin's primary purpose. Or the result is a one-side force to upgrade to something that they dislike, effectively giving a power to developers they should never have. Quote as someone, I do not sign up to be part of a central banker's community. Uh, the reason increase in, for the increase is needed. If we need more space in blocks, is the reason to do an upgrade. It won't stop after 20 megabytes. There's nothing fundamentally possible with 20 megabytes that isn't, that isn't, po- isn't with one megabyte blocks. Misrepresentation, misrepresentation of the trade-offs. You can, all, you can argue all you want that none of the effects of the larger blocks are particularly damaging, so everything is fine. They will damage something, see below for details, and we should analyze these effects and, and be honest about them and present them as trade-offs made with choices to make the scale system better. If you wish to ask people if they want more transactions, of course you'll hear yes. If you ask people if they want to pay less taxes, I'm sure the vast majority will agree as well. Minor centralization. There is currently, as far as I know, no technology that can relay and validate 20 megabyte blocks across the planet in a manner fast enough to avoid very significant costs to mining. His work in progress on, the, on this, including Gavin's IBLT-based relay or Greg's block network coding. But I don't think we should be basing the future of economics on this, of the system on undemonstrated ideas. Without those or even with, the result may be the miners self-limit the size of the blocks to propagate faster. But if this happens, larger, better connected and more centralized local groups of miners can gain a competitive advantage by being able to produce larger blocks. I'd like to point out that there's nothing evil about this. A simple feedback to determine an optimal block size for an individual miner will result in a larger block blocks for better connected hash power. If we do not want miners to have this ability, we as in those using full nodes, should demand limitations that prevent it. One such limitation is a block size limit and whatever it is. The ability to use full nodes. Skewing incentives for improvements without casual pressure to work on these, I doubt much will change. Increasing the size of blocks now will save but make it cheap enough to continue business as usual for a while, while forcing a massive cost increase and not just for monetary ones on the entire ecosystem. Fees and long-term incentives. I don't think one megabyte block is optional. Block size is a compromise between scalability of transactions and the verifi- verifiability of the system. A system with 10 transactions per day that is verified by a pocket calculator is not useful, as it would only serve a few large bank settlements. A system which can deal with every coffee bottle on the planet but requires a Google sale data center to verify it is also not useful, as it would be trivially outcompeted by the Visa like design. The useful needs is balanced, and there's no optimal choice for everyone. We can choose where the balance lies, but we must accept that this is done as a trade-off, and then the trade-off will have costs such as hardware costs, decreasing anonymity, less independence, small targeted audience for the people able to fully validate and choose wisely. And then Mike Kearns was thought, the list is not a good place for making progress or reaching decisions. If Bitcoin continues on the growth trends, it will run out of capacity almost certainly by the sometime next year, which it has occurred. We need to write, see right now the leadership and plan that fits in the available time window. I no longer believe that this community can reach consensus on anything protocol related, which is true. When the money supply eventually dwindles, I doubt it will be fee pressures to funds mining. What I don't see from you, you yet is a specific credible plan that fits with the next 12 months and which allows Bitcoin to keep growing. Peter Todd wrote that, uh, that pointing out that contrary to Mike's claims, developer consensus has been achieved within the core plenty of times recently. And BTC Dart asked Mike to explain where the 12 month time frame comes from. And this is when things start getting really contentious as people start sniping at each other. A Hori Tone wrote an incredibly present reply to Mike. I'm not going to kind of get into it. Some suspect that Gavin slash Mike were trying to rush the hard fork for personal reasons. Mike Hearn's response was 
was to demand a leader who can unilaterally steer the Bitcoin project and make decisions on check. So Micron wrote that not what I meant is that someone theoretically well learned needs to make a clear decision. If a decision the Bitcoin core will will wait and watch the fireworks when blocks get full, that would be showing leadership. I write more on the topic of what happened if we hit the block size limit. I don't believe that we'll get any useful data out of such an event. I even distribute systems run out of the capacity for it, but what will happen instead is that the technical failure is followed by rapid user abandonment. I'm not sure the user abandonment is happening, but you you are seeing that uh, Bitcoin is not the dominant force any longer. You know, you have ETC rising, Rootstock, Litecoin, other cryptocurrencies have taken its place. Zcash, Dash, Monero. Uh, we need to hear something like that from one there or whoever has final say around here. And then I'm going to read Jorge uh, Timo's response. It's true that the universal uncon- universally un controversial, which is what I think the requirement should be for hard forks, is a vague qualifier that's not formally defined anywhere. I guess we should only consider rational arguments. We cannot just knack something without further explanation. If this explanation was, I will change my mind after we increase box size, I guess the community should say that we will just ignore your knack because it makes no sense. In the same way that people use fallacies purposely or not, we must expose that and say that the fallacy doesn't count as an argument. But yeah, it would probably be good to define better what constitutes a sensible objection or something that doesn't seem simple, though. It seems that some people will like to see that happening before the subsidies are low, not necessarily null. While other people are fine waiting for that, but don't want to ever be close to the scale limit limits anytime soon, I would also like to know for how long we need to prioritize short-term adoption in this way. Others say that if the answer is forever adoption is always the most important thing, then we'll end up with an improved version of Visa. But yeah, this is progress. I'll wait for your more detailed descriptions of the tragedies that will follow hitting the block limits, assuming from now that it will happen in 12 months. Which it has happened, but previous answers you ner- to the nervous, we will hit the block limits in 12 months, and if you don't do anything, was well, not sh- not sure about 12 months, but whatever, great. I'm waiting for that to observe how, feel- how fees get affected. They rose. But it should have given a question, what's wrong with hitting the block limits in 12 months? And then my current... Uh, Again, I started the need for a leader. There must be a single decision maker for any given code base. Brian Bishop, Bishop attempts to explain why this would make sense with a Git architect. And finally, Gavin announced his intent to merge the patch into Bitcoin XT to bypass the peer review he received on the Bitcoin dev mailing list. So he basically took his ball and left. Well, there had been, um, and it, you can kind of go in the comment section, uh, origins of the debate going back as far as, you know, 2010. This is where things start really split when Gavin and Deason basically kind of left uh, the Bitcoin core. Mike Kern would, you know, kind of eventually follow. And you have all these different solutions from SegWit that was proposed um, during this time frame, Bitcoin XT, Bitcoin Classic, and then eventually we got Bitcoin Unlimited, Bitcoin, all these different stuff going on. Again, you can see kind of the same players, you know, Gregory Maxwell in here. Mike Hearn, uh, Peter Todd, all kind of going back and forth in the discussion about what is essentially the core of Bitcoin. Is it this decentralized system of store value uh, that allows for people to transmit wealth back to forth from one another? Or are we just duplicating Visa where we're having a Visa transactions and does that make any kind of practical sense? Should people be able to buy coffee on this type of system? Does that make any type of sense? Uh, miners incentives, the importance of miners, and are they going to be able to be in a position or a place to continue to be mining and be incentivized economically with the fees in funding of the Bitcoin? And what happens when the, when we increase the block size and then you have nodes which are supposed to validate the entire system, which are not compensated. People who operate nodes are not compensated within the Bitcoin system. People just do it to do it for the purpose of keeping the network going, if you will. So there's that. And all this in the sauce, if you will, all this is what kind of really is the beginning of the contention where we get these different proposals within the Bitcoin core itself. There's two different versions of uh, SegWit, and we'll, we'll break down all the different kind of from the core developers themselves and their different proposals to address the scaling issues and addressing uh, the usage of Bitcoin in general out there on the network but it's just kind of a reminder here of how there was a kind of a split there was a contention and people kind of went different ways and what the thought process is of the people that were responsible for coding the 
the protocol. So that was all the way in March, and it's when back in this down all the way that year of 2015 is when SegWit was proposed by Peter Will. I'm going to read this article from Coindesk, and then it's going to pretty much wrap up the episode, if you will. 